Okay, I think we're gonna get going here. So good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the country, and thank you for joining us for today's virtual meeting on federal agency response in this crazy time of COVID-19. This is the third in a series of meetings that we are hosting on justice responses to COVID-19. And each Wednesday, we'll be covering a different portion of the system. I'm Susan Frederick, and I staff NCSL's Law, Criminal Justice, and Public Safety Committee, as well as our Cybersecurity Task Force at NCSL. And I will be your host for this afternoon's, this morning's uh, briefing. There are a number of NCSL staff on the call that specialize in state and federal criminal justice policy. And please call on us at any time to answer any of the questions to provide you with assistance, um, crystal ball looking. Uh, and we want you to be the most effective leaders you can be in your state, so we're here to help. I'd like to cover a couple of logistics of the meeting before we get started. Karen McGinnis is our person managing our controls today, and we have everyone on mute at the moment to ensure audio quality of the presenters. Amanda Essex and Lucia Bragg will be monitoring the chat box for uh, questions and information and resources. The chat box, if you don't already know, is either going to be located on the right side of your screen or you can access it by clicking on the word bubble symbol in the navigation bar. I encourage you to take advantage of this function. Throughout the meeting, our speakers may be referencing various resources as well, and Amanda will be dropping links into the, uh, the chat box for those resources. They'll also be posted online um, in addition. Also use the chat box to submit questions to the faculty who will be speaking throughout the meeting. Lucia will be collecting those questions for Q&A. We do have the resource page and after the meeting we'll add any additional resources and a recording of this meeting as well. Bios for our speakers are also available on that page. So let's get to it. Today you will hear about state agency priorities and response resulting from COVID-19 in the areas of Homeland Security and Small Business uh, Administration. Our first speaker will be Deputy Director Matthew Travis. DDR Travis serves as the first Deputy Director for the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. He has served as Deputy Undersecretary for the National Protection and Programs Directorate before the agency became CISA on November 16, 2018. As Deputy Director, uh, Mr. Uh, Director Travis supports the CISA Director in overseeing the Cybersecurity Division, the Infrastructure Security Division, the National Risk Management Center, and um, the Emergency Communications Division. His operational support responsibilities are to ensure a holistic approach to critical infrastructure protection across the physical and cyber risks activities. We have reserved time at the end of, of this presentation for the questions as Deputy Director Travis will need to drop off for another commitment. If we do not have time to address all the questions, we are saving the chat conversation and we'll have responses later. So with that, I will turn the meeting over to Deputy Director Travis. Thanks, Susan, and good afternoon, everyone. Good to be with you. I, I want to thank the conference for the, for the invitation. Anytime I get a chance to talk to NCSL members, uh, generally it's been with the Cybersecurity Task Force, so we jump at it. You, you all are one of our, our premier partners, and uh, I welcome the opportunity to talk during these, uh, these challenging times. On, on behalf of my boss, Director Chris Krebs, as well as Acting Secretary Chad Wolf, I certainly hope that all of you, your families, and your, your, your colleagues in state legislatures across the country are healthy and, and safe as we're all battling through this together. As Susan said, I'm the deputy at CISA, and don't feel bad if you haven't heard of us. I think we're still technically the, the, the newest federal government agency. And we exist really to protect, uh, to work with owners and operators, as well as state, local, tribal, and territorial officials to, to protect those 16 sectors of America's critical infrastructure, both from physical and electronic attack. So the fact that that makes us the leading civilian cybersecurity agency in the United States, uh, we are headquartered here in, in Washington, but we have a presence 
Uh, throughout the country, we have a regional structure, not unlike FEMA's, and so we've got both cybersecurity advisors and protective security advisors and risk analysts all throughout the country uh, working with your constituents and working with uh, your colleagues throughout the country. And so generally it is the, the cyber side of our portfolio that gets a lot of the attention. I'm gonna certainly talk about that, but uh, what the pandemic brought to light for us, and not actually for us, but maybe folks who work with us, is just how important the, the physical side of America's infrastructure is. And when the department was created, when DHS was created after 9-11, the real focus was protecting infrastructure from foreign terrorists. Uh, technically, we protected against you know, tornadoes and earthquakes as well, but now we realize we have to protect it against microbes and pandemics like COVID-19, and not necessarily because the infrastructure itself is under attack, but as we've seen, the workforce is. And without the workforce, we, we don't have an infrastructure. So I'm gonna talk through a few of the things that we've done and we've learned throughout this uh, pandemic environment for the past couple of months, and then pivot a bit talking about some of the cybersecurity challenges uh, that this has brought about and what we're doing about it as well, and certainly we'll leave time for questions. So as this began to, uh, to emerge in, in February, and then certainly only March, and by mid-March, I think we realized we were in for something new, uh, we recognized that one of the things that we probably took for granted was just how uh, fragile some of our infrastructure is in terms of supply chains. Uh, you know, when we think of uh, critical infrastructure, we think in terms of national critical functions. That's a construct that we've created at our National Risk Management Center. And what we mean by that are, what are those systems, what are those activities, uh, what are those functions, those organizations that are engaged in those things that either uh, sustain us in terms of lifelines, that, that drive our economy, that enable our security, that propel the American way of life. Those, those things like uh, the food supply and, and transportation and banking and, and, and all those things that go into how we live. And once this pandemic uh, took hold and we realized we had to shut down large portions of not only the economy, but large portions of states, we recognized how uh, at risk uh, many of those national critical functions had become. And so one of the first uh, demand signals that we heard from our industry partners as well as from uh, state and local officials was the need to harmonize how we are prioritizing what infrastructure uh, should be given uh, access uh, during a restricted environment. So when we, we have stay-at-home orders and we have you know essentially a quarantine environment and we're shutting down uh, acti economic activity, we recognize that there's some economic activity that we have to maintain. And so, you know, federalism is a, it's a tricky thing. It's a great thing, but it's a tricky thing. And so interstate commerce, you know, as we, as we realized that uh, as, as industry needed to move goods and services across state lines and even within states across jurisdictions, that there was a need for all of us to be on the same sheet of music in terms of what was of enough priority to allow those workers allow those, those trucks and cars and other the means of, of modes of transportation to move freely throughout our, our restricted jurisdiction. So we worked with our analysts and, and, and our stakeholders and, and came up with really was our first COVID-19 product, which was the Essential Critical Infrastructure Workforce Guidance. And really what this was, was you know, we have 16 formal sectors of critical infrastructure. But those are general categories. And what we realized, what the, what the pandemic forced us to do was really take stock on, okay, throughout those 16 sectors of infrastructure, what do we really need to keep moving and keep operating during a pandemic? And so uh, we came out, I think it was probably uh, late March when we first issued the first version of this essential workforce list. It really was just a list. It was a list of those types of occupations there wasn't any type of Department of Labor job series uh, classification, but general descriptions of the types of workers uh, that needed to be given access in a restricted environment, that need to be granted that right of way, that needed to be allowed to continue working and be able to pass through checkpoints and not be pulled over by uh, law enforcement officials for breaking quarantine. We found that to be helpful. We found that to be somewhat, um, uh, not necessarily contentious, but there was certainly not surprisingly a lot of uh, industry partners who maybe weren't on the initial list that were, were engaging their, uh, all of their networks to, uh, to make the case to us on why they were essential. Everyone is critical and in critical infrastructure, but not necessarily everyone's essential. And so 
Uh, let me say that this list and all the things I'm going to talk about are available on our CISA.gov uh, uh, yeah, website. And so uh, that, that list also helped, I think, inform some of the guidance that came out of the White House. And certainly as we move to this three-phase uh, program of Opening Up America, we still want to make sure that we are looking at the, uh, some type of prioritization scheme to guide how we, how we open up the country. And I think, uh, I think some of that guidance has been used not only from the White House, but from CDC as well. And I'm happy to take questions on, on, on this uh, line of effort that we embarked upon. The other thing that the COVID uh, experience has taught us is that it really has uh, led, the, led the way of a new digital transformation. Uh, we are certainly working with all of our uh, public and private sector partners to ensure that uh, infrastructure remains operational but we're also working now on the cyber side to make sure that they are able to work in a, a distributed and uh, distributed posture in a telework environment. You know, the technology we're using right here for this meeting is the, is the technology that we're gonna rely upon for the future, not just through the, the end of this pandemic, but I think as, as we move on, we'll, we'll see more and more need or desire to, to operate remotely. And so that's, that's a great convenience. The fact that NCSL has been able to get us all together here and have a discussion is a fantastic thing. But there's a security side to it, right? And so like with most things, cyber, there are great benefits, but there are trade-offs in terms of risk. And when we move to home, we're kind of leaving the protections of, of that uh, corporate in security environment or government security environment that we generally operate in. And we're moving to our own house where we may not have the same protections in terms of our own uh, in-house networks uh, if, or, or are we using VPN and if we're using VPN are there vulnerabilities in that VPN and so this has really brought about a whole host of issues that we need to make sure we are taking into account as our workforce as as your staffs and state capitals and your constituents in your states are working that we're, we're, we're expanding the, the aperture and what we consider to be good cyber hygiene and we've already seen uh, over the past few months, an uptick of malicious cyber activity aimed at, at uh, some of this new technology and some of this rapidly emerging technology uh, that deals with remote access and, and this telework infrastructure. Uh, it's concerning to see bad actors during a global pandemic take advantage of some of this, these vulnerabilities, but that's just the reality of the world. So to help network defenders, we've launched a dedicated product line, which is intended to advise and support organizations uh, with the surge in telework due to coronavirus. And these new products include a joint CISA and NSA, that's National Security Agency, telework best practices guide, in addition to some cybersecurity considerations for the use of video conferencing software, as well as other collaboration tools. Uh, this guidance, as well as other uh, good helpful tips from some of our partners can be found again on our uh, CISA.gov website, that's CISA.gov. And uh, we've also issued a lot of guidance to government agencies, departments and agencies. Now they're on a different structure being on the federal.gov and this, uh, we've got what's called a TIC, a Trusted Internet Connection Protocols. We've just un unveiled the, the 3.0 version of that, uh, which uh, helps uh, departments and agencies at the federal level manage their security posture uh, from a uh, distributed environment as well. So that was timely that we released that when we did. These cyber protections that we all must uh, you know, implement, especially relates to these remote uh, tools, is of critical importance because we know, as we've seen, that these malicious actors are gonna take advantage of, of our new posture. Uh, we're seeing a number of you know, tried and true techniques to, to gain access to individual email accounts, to, to get access to network, uh, to company networks, uh, to steal credentials, and uh, you know, a lot of it comes from COVID-19 themed phishing uh, campaigns. And you generally see this, even when there's a hurricane or tornado, uh, you'll see disaster related emails come into folks' emails accounts. Say, hey, you know, here, click here to get uh, information on a FEMA grant or something, things like that. And, and unfortunately, we see, we, we're seeing a lot of uh, COVID-19 related uh, spear phishing attempts. So we wanna make sure that uh, here at CISA that we're collaborating with, with all our partners to provide uh, where some of these indicators of compromise are coming from. So CIOs and CISOs can block some of these IP addresses. Uh, we've also partnered with some of our international allies like uh, the UK and their National Cybersecurity Center 
uh, to release joint alerts where we see uh, phishing scams and attacks on VPN systems to try to help uh, secure the global ecosystem, which is going through the same thing uh, that, that we're going through. We've also seen a lot of uh, high volume password spraying campaigns against the healthcare industry. Uh, you've seen a lot of, not only has HHS itself and, and CDC and NIH been under a high volume attack, any, any company, biotech labs, pharmaceutical firms that are in the healthcare hospital systems uh, have seen a large increase in, in, in attack uh, attack traffic. And uh, we're seeing some of this from nation state actors and we're seeing some of this from just regular cyber, cyber criminals. And we've, uh, we've took immediate action along with uh, the Brits also publishing an advisory for international healthcare uh, organizations in terms of some of the things that the healthcare industry in particular should be looking out for. The other thing we've seen is an increase in activity against, and some of you probably know this, uh, state unemployment agencies have seen a high target uh, or been, been a high target for malicious activity. Uh, an influx of scammers trying to take advantage of, of systems that states are using for filing unemployment benefits. And we certainly understand the need for state agencies to get this money out to, uh, to our unemployed citizens. Uh, but this has made those, those systems uh, targets for fraudsters and, and hackers. Uh, cyber criminals know that generally state and local jurisdictions uh, have smaller IT budgets than the federal government or from big corporations. And so that in and of itself makes them targets. So we're always looking to reduce the risk and making sure that we're trying to put out as much guidance as we can uh, for state and local jurisdictions to take some of these uh, protective measures and also improve their overall situational awareness. Uh, as this continues to unfold, we're going to continue to put out as much guidance as we can, along with our partners at the FBI and other intelligence community within the U.S. and foreign partners to maintain a uh, vigilant watch on the, on the cyber ecosystem as long as the pandemic uh, persists. And we ask that you work with us and, and take advantage of uh, the information we're putting out there and, and spread the good news among your states to make sure that your constituents as well as state agencies are doing all that they can to protect themselves during the heightened uh, cyber risk. Let me make a final point on election security, because I know it's, on, uh, it's a priority for many of you, and, and certainly generally before COVID, this was always the, you know, the top line uh, that I would ever talk about in public. I would start with election security, because it, it, it was and still is really the, 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 the thrust of what we've been doing uh, for, for a number of months now, and, and the pandemic has certainly put a different uh, feel to it and that some of the primaries have been postponed, but uh, you know, the election process continues and we're, we're in a full court press to get every, every state, every community as, as, as resilient and secure for the November elections as we can. Obviously, uh, COVID has changed the nature of how we think about conducting elections. So we have been working very closely with all 50 states and, and more than about 3,500 localities in conducting vulnerability assessments, engaging with partners, and sharing some of the threat data that, that, that we see. Uh, we're also looking or working with uh, the Election Assistance Commission, or EAC, uh, and actually created a working group uh, uh, since the COVID outbreak uh, to look at uh, how we can improve or uh, you know, increase capacity for voting by mail. Obviously, uh, there is going to be an impediment for the type of in-person voting, whether it's um, in November because the pandemic is, is, still among, is still among us or just the sensibilities that people are gonna have or the version they might have to, to going out in a public place uh, and casting a vote. So we're really pushing to make sure that vote by mail provisions are being built and, and increased for the anticipated increased volume of vote by mail. And we're also, uh, working with the United States Postal Service as well as the CDC on election specific uh, activities. So uh, we again, we have a lot of election information on our system.gov website and encourage you all to check out that. We maintain our position that uh, voting through the internet uh, involves too much risk, it opens up too much uh, room for mischief. And so absentee voting, voting by mail, those are things that we feel reasonably sure we can secure as well as in-person voting. Uh, but you'll see on the news, I'm sure you have a lot of interest in uh, voting through the internet or voting through apps and from a risk our risk informed lens uh, we, we remain uh, uh, not not a supporter of, of that mode of voting so uh, I'll sum it up by saying that you are incredibly important to not only the the cyber ecosystem but also what I said at the beginning 
making sure that our infrastructure can continue to not only remain viable, but to thrive under a pandemic. Uh, we need, it's not just the food supply, it's, it's the, you know, the, some of the mechanical sectors that repair our, our trucks, uh, that, that, that manufacture components that run factories, uh, as well as uh, other, probably, you know, other elements of our economy that may not be at the forefront all the time, but when a pandemic happens, you realize how valuable all different parts of America's infrastructure are and making sure that we can continue uh, you know, growing our nation and, and living our lives. And so uh, at the state level, it's important that uh, your constituents are informed about this and that your industry partners are aware of the things that they need to do to make sure that you are aware of the things that they need. And, and where CISA can be a facilitator of that discussion, we welcome that role. So uh, we're collectively uh, looking to protect our infrastructure our networks and our elections. And uh, we do that as partners with you. But one thing I'll say too is that everything we do is a voluntary partnership. I've, Susan's heard me say this in some of the task force meetings. I have one regulatory authority and that is over the chemical industry. We regulate security standards for the chemical industry. Everything else we do is voluntary. So no one has to work with CISA. And so we try to take on a very much a customer service model of, of leaning forward and, and trying to make as many people aware of our information uh, briefs and alerts, our exercises, our training, our technical services. We continue to have um, the ability to help uh, diagnose and, and, and help do vulnerability assessments on uh, computer networks. Everything we do is free, uh, but everything we do is a voluntary partnership. So uh, if, if, if some of your colleagues are not aware of CISA, please help them uh, learn more about us, send them our websites, and we look forward to working with you uh, not only through this pandemic, but hopefully soon when this pandemic uh, is over and getting back to some degree of normalcy. So thanks for all that you're doing throughout state capitals. And uh, thank you for inviting me here today. Back to you, Susan. Thank you, Deputy Director. And I know we have um, a couple of questions. Lucia's going to tee those up. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Director, for uh, for joining. That was an excellent overview. So while folks are um, uh, thinking about their questions uh, and then again encourage everyone to enter any questions you might have uh, for the deputy director there in the chat box. We're doing the Q&A a little bit different today where we're following the, the questions directly after the presenters. Um, so uh, for now I'd like to queue us up with a question. So you know is there a, a reporting mechanism that folks can use to submit fraudulent information that they come across or um, constituents come across? Absolutely. So we have a, an operations center at 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you go to our website, you'll see a couple of buttons that if you want to report something COVID related or something cyber related, uh, you can uh, you know, hit that button and it'll give us an email. There's also, I think, a phone number that's listed. You want to call us directly. And again, we've got uh, folks around the clock who are fielding uh, inquiries and requests. And uh, absolutely, please, when you see malicious behavior uh, when you see, or, or if you have you know, questions or need assistance uh, on something that's not cyber related, but it deals with America's infrastructure, certainly we welcome that uh, communication. Yeah, excellent. And, and you know, we can certainly provide that on our resources page after the fact, so folks can um, locate that there. Um, and, uh, you know, just especially for this group, I think, you know, uh, we we would probably wonder. You know, is does CISA provide you know technical assistance to states? Um, you know, to help them navigate cyber issues in the state networks in particular, especially as state legislatures are moving to you know virtual sessions and even voting. We do. So as I mentioned on the onset, we have field personnel throughout the country. Now we don't have enough of them, and so. Uh, while I can't ask you to lobby on our behalf, anytime I'm up on a Capitol Hill, I, I try to stress that uh, you know, we are still building out the agency. And in my mind, the full maturation of our agency, we're going to have a state coordinator in every state, as well as a number of both cybersecurity and protective security advisors uh, throughout the country. So where we are currently in every state, which is some states, some areas, we just don't have enough folks. So that said, uh, you know, we do everything we can never to say no. And anytime whether it's a local jurisdiction, whether it's a mayor or a city manager, whether it's a head of a state agency, uh, if you need assistance with your, you know, um, your networks in terms of a vulnerability assessment, we can 
uh, do that in person. We also have deployed teams that we haven't, you know, we, we've held them at bay here during the pandemic, except for emergencies. But uh, for normal operations, we've got teams that will deploy on location and work with your organizations to do uh, in-person testing and assessments of not only uh, the, the network configuration, as well as the, the type of traffic that's coming into your system, but also kind of an administrative review of you know, who has access to your network, what type of uh, SOPs do you have? Because you know, part of cybersecurity is making sure that uh, you're restricting who actually has access to your network, helping you understand what's on your network, those types of basic questions that cyber hygiene uh, we do, again, free of charge. And uh, the other thing I will say, everything we do, whether you're a private sector company, whether you're a, a, a municipal organization or a public organization, one, it's free. Two, that's a relationship between CISA and you. And so we don't uh, share that information. That is your report in terms of where we see potential vulnerabilities or recommendations, whether it's an election system or just a state network. That's all um, protected information between you and us. And uh, our folks don't, uh, don't barge into your, your building with uh, you know, CISA windbreakers. Uh, these are cyber folks. May, you know, they probably look like your college age kids more than anything else wearing t-shirts and sneakers, uh, but they're really the, the, the best at what they do. They're really uh, very talented uh, cyber technicians and we're, we're happy to partner with you on that one. Excellent, yeah, that's great news. Um, that'd be a great resource um, as well. I, you know, one more, you know, especially uh, of interest for this group and, you know, for our members is, you know, wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on the, you know, the working groups active on the, the vote by mail um, issue. And, you know, as we're thinking about upcoming election uh, day, days and yeah, any resources on that. So I can certainly come back to, to you and Susan and get you an update and have Matt Masterson, who's our elections uh, guru, to talk about that. I've not personally been involved in those discussions, and I know they're relatively new that we stood them up uh, with the AIEAC once the pandemic kind of kicked in. But I think you'll be hearing more from us on the election front here as the, we get into the summer, and as the fall gets closer, about how we're, all the different ways we can ensure you know, we got to make sure that everyone has a chance to vote, make sure that vote is uh, secure, make sure it's counted. And whether that's by mail or person, uh, we're going to do all that we can to enable uh, election jurisdictions across the country uh, to do it uh, in a secure and efficient way. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you, Deputy Director. Uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker now. And I would like to now introduce Ryan Lambert. Uh, in his current role, Mr. Lambert serves as a senior advisor for the U.S. Small Business Administration's Congressional and Legislative Affairs Office, working closely with congressional staff. Ryan also handles SBA's intergovernmental affairs, providing a direct contact for state and local elected officials across the nation. After graduating from the University of South Carolina, he spent years working with clients running for political office and eventually opened up a small business consulting firm based in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He's been with the SBA since 2017 and his various roles have allowed him to travel to different parts of the country hearing from small businesses yeah. and how the Small Business Administration can be a better resource to them. So I will now turn the uh, meeting over to Ryan Lambert. Uh, thank you very much. I, I hope you guys can hear me. If not, let me know. Um, but, but first of all, I, I want to thank the conference again for allowing uh, the SBA to participate here. And, and I wanted to kind of give an overview of uh, what the agency is doing uh, in relations to the CARES Act that had been passed uh, about a month ago or so. And, and I think at, at this point, there's really four lanes that um, I think you've probably heard of, and I, I want to give an update there. And the first would be Paycheck Protection Program, which I think at this point everybody has heard of. Everybody has uh, probably known a small business who uh, has been uh, impacted by the Paycheck Protection Program uh, through a lender. And so, you know, between the round one and now the second round of funding, uh, there's been over 4.3 million loans given out uh, for this, this program, which is huge. Those are very large numbers. Uh, in really what amounts to about four and a half to five weeks total at this point. 
um, you know, that's $512 billion in loans. And, and what we had said during round one for the agency, um, we said that it, we did 14 years worth of loans in just 14 days. And now with round two, we've done more loans in round two than we did in round one. So, uh, you know, that is kind of indicative of, of a couple of things that I want to get into. Uh, one, that's, you know, your health and, and everybody else's health, uh, making sure that the word continues to get spread out to uh, your constituents, your small business owners, uh, so they know where to go. Uh, where they can go and apply for these loans and they know where to get the information that they need. Um, but it also is, uh, is indicative of the work that our lending team has put on to really help and bring on new participating lenders uh, across the nation. Because at the end of the day, uh, the small business has to go to a lender uh, to apply for these loans. Uh, these aren't SBA given loans. These are SBA guaranteed loans. Uh, and so, you know, just we went from about 1,500 uh, ish uh, lenders participating in our regular 7A program that were active uh, to, uh, you know, over 5,000, almost 5,500 actual lenders uh, across the nation that uh, are able to give these loans out or, or offer these loans at least. And what that number doesn't include is the tens of thousands of people inside that work for those lenders. Uh, that also have access to be able to give these loans. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot of movement in a very short period of time uh, in both rounds of the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and, and I understand that uh, you know, there's guidance that is coming out uh, daily almost, uh, either through interim final rules or also uh, frequently asked questions. And uh, I just urge you to, you know, if you have constituents or if you yourself have a small business and continue to look, uh, you know, are looking for uh, new guidance and updating guidance, uh, all of that is always available and always updated uh, on sba.gov slash paycheck protection or treasury.gov slash cares. Um, either of those websites will have uh, the most up-to-date information uh, now, jumping back real quick just to the loan size, uh, and I mentioned that we've done more loans this round than the first round. And, and what that really shows is uh, that these loans that we're doing for round two are much smaller. And, and because this is based off of a formula on how many uh, staff members you have, how many employees you have, uh, it's really showing that these are smaller and smaller companies, which is really helping out. Um, and on top of that, the, the round two statutory language for paycheck protection the, that refunded the program, uh, it carved out $60 billion for small and medium sized lenders uh, to be able to make sure that uh, those lenders and their clients uh, or their, their small businesses have a chance to apply for these loans. Uh, now the administrator, Administrator Jovita Carranza, she took it a step further and I uh, made uh, about eight hours uh, on the, during the first week uh, dedicated to the smallest of the small lenders that were under uh, a certain threshold to ensure that their clients, who are also very, very small businesses generally, uh, have a chance to get their application uploaded into the system, into our SBA system, which just means that uh, they have access to the program, which is a, a major deal and a, 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 a proactive step that the administrator took to, to make sure that, that these companies and these businesses had access to uh, the, the loans. So um, that continues to roll. I mentioned there was over $512 billion in loans that have been given out um, or had, had been guaranteed at this point. And so uh, we, there's still funding available, and I, I want to ask uh, for your help in just continuing to, to spread the word, whether it's through social media or uh, if you're speaking to chambers of commerce and, and uh, small businesses are there or, or wherever it might be, um, because this is really a, a vital lifeline for uh, not only small businesses, but also the, um, the employees as well. And, and so that takes care of uh, the Paycheck Protection Program. The, the second item I, I think everybody has been aware of mostly um, is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, where the uh, CARES Act uh, 
itself, the, the bill itself actually created another piece to an economic injury disaster loan, what we call an up to $10,000 advance uh, or $1,000 per employee. And really what that is, that's a brand new program that we had to stand up in just seven days. And, and at this point, there's been over um, $10 billion of non-repayable advances that have gone out. Of, uh, and again, these are non-repayable. So um, they essentially act as a grant, but um, there's, it's a, a important lifeline as well. And then the second piece is the actual loan itself, the economic injury disaster loan. Now that loan is, uh, it is a loan, but it's a very long-term 30-year uh, loan. So it's much lower uh, repayment, uh, low interest, and, and a real good working capital loan for the small businesses getting through COVID. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if the numbers are up online, but um, we've done over $24 billion uh, in those in, in idle loans. So then third here, I want to move over to uh, another piece of the CARES Act called debt relief. And what debt relief is, make, is allowing the SBA to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is to pay for existing SBA loans for the next six months. And this is an important piece because this includes all of the SBA loans, all of the 7A loans, uh, the normal standard uh, loans that we have uh, available that, that you know, small businesses already have. So for six months, the SBA is going to pay the lender that is making these loans uh, so that the small business doesn't have to worry about that, uh, that, that charge or that fee. And, um, and that's, a, that's a big uh, relief and, and big help for the small businesses as well. And then the last piece here, <clears throat> I'd like to switch over and, and talk about the resource partners, which, uh, you know, on a local side, you, you, may be in, you may be familiar with. If not, I urge you to work with them uh, and, and connect with them. But we call our resource partners are the small business development centers, women's business centers, and the SCORE chapters. And what they do is they provide free counseling and training for small businesses across the nation. Uh, and there's over a thousand offices of, of those. So I, I, I uh, really believe there, there's more, it's most, more likely that you will have a, an office very close to you. Um, and, and they do more than just counseling and training. They also provide, uh, they do events for small businesses and, and very often coordinate and, uh, and work together with local elected officials, state elected officials, as well as on the federal side as well. So, uh, but that ties into the CARES Act because we've gotten additional funding uh, to offer to the resource partners in the form of a grant uh, for them to uh, focus on COVID-19 uh, assistance to small businesses. And at this point, those funds have been going out for the last week and a half. Uh, the, the team that is in charge of that here at SBA uh, has worked very quickly and very closely with uh, the, the leaders of uh, those of the small business development centers and the women's business centers to ensure that their grants get out quickly and that they're able to uh, utilize this and help the small businesses. So if you haven't yet, uh, I would urge you to, to reach out to your closest um, uh, resource partner and see um, if they have any events going on or if there's any way that, uh, that, that you know, any important information that they're doing on the local side that would be uh, important and, and useful for you guys to know. And the last piece, uh, and I, I'm sure you all have already in, worked with, but uh, our district offices are a important piece to our field program uh, at the SBA. Uh, and, and we have 68 district offices across the nation, but inside of those district offices, we have uh, over 500 employees. And th that is, those are SBA uh, staff members, and, and they're there year in, year out in the community. Uh, and, and their whole role is, is to help the small business community 
um, and, and really integrate in uh, also on with the local elected officials or the state elected officials or the federal side as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to really encourage uh, your outreach and, and your uh, uh, integration with the district offices, the SBA district offices, uh, if you haven't yet, um, because there's, they are a good resource for you uh, and, and are always there. Uh, and, and all of those, the resource partners, as well as the district offices, their locations, the contact information, uh, and, and anything else you might need, uh, all of that can be found on, on our website at sba.gov. Uh, we have a map where you can put in uh, your zip code or your area, and, and that would come up. Um, now, I want to just uh, close out with, with a couple of things here. I, I think uh, one, you know, I, it was mentioned the office is uh, intergovernmental affairs at the SBA, and uh, I just want to make sure that you guys know that, that my office, I'm always available for whatever you might need uh, from a headquarters stand. Uh, standpoint, but we also have regional administrators who are also a good resource for you. And I would suggest that you reach out to them as well. And um, so with that, I am open to questions here. I don't know how we want to go about this, but pass this back to you. Uh, hey, Ryan. Yeah, thanks so much for your presentation. That's really helpful. And I know that it's been, uh, it's been a really hot topic. Uh, and you've been really responsive and helpful to NCSL. So I really, yeah, thank you for that and for your partnership. Um, while folks are thinking about questions, um, I know that, you know, there are some recent, uh, we've gotten some recent questions, you know, from members and that folks have been wondering, you know, of course, funds ran out once um, for these programs, um, as we know, and were replenished by the most recent stimulus package. Um, wondering what is the likelihood, do you think, that that will happen again? And do you anticipate when that might happen? Uh, again, all in, in a keeping in mind that legislators are going to be trying to, state legislators are going to be trying to advise um, you know, their, their constituents, you know, they're fielding these questions all the time. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Sure. Sure. So, so that comes to mind two things. Um, one, uh, I want to break out paycheck protection and idle for this answer, but the first with paycheck protection, there's still funds available. Uh, there's still a good bit of funds available, um, because of, of how the, the, you know, we have to, we pay uh, a fee to the lenders for every loan that they make. I, I don't have an exact number of how much is, but, but there's something like uh, uh, six hundred and fifty billion dollars for the loan program itself. And, and so far, we've gone through five hundred and twelve billion dollars. So there's there's quite a bit. And again, it goes back to uh, the loans themselves are are much smaller this time. And, and so. You know, this is it's being spread out a little bit longer than it did last time, which last time it took 14 days. Right. And and now we're on, uh, I believe this is week three. Uh, we're still funding less. Um, so that's that's a good thing. It's just, you know, it's, it's still out there. Now, on the economic injury disaster loan, I think uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that, you know, we did uh, for the first time in, in the SBA history, the entire nation and every territory. Uh, was open for an economic injury disaster loan. So small businesses in, in any state, in any territory that met the requirements could apply. And, and so we, we maxed out, hit, hit the program cap, as, as you mentioned, um, and, and that's kind of where we stood until we got additional funding. And, and the unfortunate part is while we were waiting for funding, uh, we were not able, we were unable to uh, review any applications at that time for a program that had no funding. So, um, but, but then once we got more funding, which we are in now, we have been reviewing and, and pushing out uh, the dollars as, as we make a decision on the loan. In the meantime, the, the round two of funding for economic injury disaster loan allowed for the first time in SBA's history also, for agriculture enterprises, agriculture businesses to be able to apply uh, for these economic injury disaster loans. And, and so we opened up uh, a limited, um, 
eligibility for for ag businesses to be able to apply for economic injury disaster loans or idle uh, so that's going on now as far as funding um, you know it's it's again it's always up to uh, the House and Senate on on if funding but at this point um, we 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 still do have funding so that's uh, I think kind of where we're at okay uh, great that was really helpful um, uh, so, can, is it safe to assume, brief follow-up, that there isn't at this time, and maybe this is maybe this is not a question for you, but there isn't at this time, you know, additional funding for those programs being considered, or do, do you see that as likely for the next stimulus? Hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't answer that on, on yeah. it being considered or not, um, but I, I would just go back to, again, we, we still, right now, at this point, uh, the, the programs are still open, uh, just with idle. Uh, we needed to make, or we wanted to make a, um, we wanted to make sure that ag businesses had a chance uh, to apply because the, the reality is that the non-ag businesses had about a month nationwide, uh, depending, it might have been a little bit less, but um, about a month to be able to apply for economic injury disaster loans before it ran out of the first round of funding. But now with ag, we just want to make sure that they have a chance here. And so, so to clarify, um, currently, uh, the EIDL loans are only being accepted for farmers. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we're, we're calling it agriculture enterprises. There's a very specific okay. definition, but it's, it, it is an agriculture business. Um, and, and the reality, the reason why, uh, just what we've been able to gather, the reason why, uh, one, they were set by the law, they were not able to get an idle loan um, because my understanding is that USDA has a program available for them, mm -hmm. but it doesn't pertain to COVID like our, our idle loan does now. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Um, I, I would, uh, for this group in particular, just want to swi switch gears to the, the kind of like eligibility requirements around um, both the, the PPP and the idle loans. It, specifically on the the criminal criminal history uh, requirements, uh, and I know that there's like been been specific guidance released on that mm. for paycheck protection, but there hasn't been on idle. But there's still questions on the application for the idle loan on criminal history. So can you um, talk about the those eligibility requirements and how it restricts who is eligible? Uh, yeah, I could kind of talk in a in a top line broad sense on it. I know we had spoken about uh, the idle piece. Um, idle is a, a little different than the Paycheck Protection Program, where idle is a program that we have year in year out, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so we have uh, what we call standard operating procedures, and and that really lay out. Um, and, and there is, you know, or, or was when I last saw, you know, some sort of a, a barrier or restriction on uh, depending if you do have a criminal history. Uh, I don't have the specifics right in front of me, but that is, they are online, uh, what is there. But with paycheck protection, um, I, I think what is important here is there's different or there's guidance pieces that are being pushed out for that, uh, that program. And, uh, and, but they, it also integrates into our existing 7A loan program, which is a program that we have year in, year out. Uh, and, and so some of the regulations and the rules, um, such as the, the criminal history and whatnot, originally come from that program because of the way that the, the legislation is written uh, and, and everything integrates together. Now, right. when uh, the, the reality though is that, you know, any suggestions or any feedback that you guys are getting from constituents or small businesses or whatnot, um, we're always open to taking it uh, and, and we make sure that it's shared with our uh, policy team and, and, and so they can uh, be aware of, of what is being um, uh, heard and, and talked about. Yeah, I mean, you know, of course, we don't, I won't speak for our membership entirely, but, you know, as you might be aware, there's the con potential concern there that, you know, businesses, certain businesses are being left out of this important aid because, um, 
because some of their owners, you know, an owner or, you know, uh, what have you, a founder, um, doesn't have, or has a, has a criminal history of some sort. So, um, we don't have, you know, policy on that necessarily. Well, we sort of do reentry policy at, at our committee, but, um, you know, it's certainly something that, you know, we're seeing, you know, legislative fixes on the Hill already. And like folks are talking about, so, um, that's why we kind of ask and monitor the situation. Yeah. And, and look, I, you know, I, I urge you to, you know, let me know what you're hearing and, and we can kind of go from there. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, excellent. Uh, that's been really helpful. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for bearing, bearing with us there. Um, don't mean to grill you. Um, I think not seeing any additional questions here in the, the chat box, but um, yeah, I guess I'll turn it back to, to Susan uh, for some closing comments. Thank you, Ryan, for your uh, very helpful remarks. Um, as a reminder, all of the resources that are listed in the chat box uh, will be saved and we will uh, be also posting this meeting, which has been recorded as well on our website. If you have any follow-up questions and you'd like to submit them after this meeting ends, if you think of something, please let us know and we'll get back to you. I'd like to uh, thank the NCSL staff for organizing this meeting and helping us with the logistics. Uh, it's the NCSL criminal justice team, my stalwart colleagues uh, who are very, very helpful in all of this. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you next week for our final virtual meeting in this series taking place on May 27th. That meeting is called COVID-19, Justice Responses for Community Supervision. It will feature Kathy Waters, the Division Director of the Adult Probation Services Division in Arizona, and Kelly Mitchell, the Executive Director of the Rovina Institute of Criminal Law and Criminal Justice, as well as the chair of the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. So until then, hope you stay safe, um, stay well, have a great Memorial Day weekend, and we will reconvene next week. Thank you everyone for attending today's meeting.